Beyond Good and Evil by Friedrich Nietzsche, part one, on the prejudices of philosophers. Friedrich Nietzsche was a German philosopher who was born in 1844 in a small village in Prussia, part of present-day Germany, called Rocken by Lutzen. When Nietzsche was only four years old, his father died. After being raised by his mother, he began to study philology, a combination of literature, linguistics and history, at the University of Leipzig. Here, he was influenced by the writings of German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, and he also became friends with German composer Richard Wagner. Then he became a professor at the University of Bonn and began publishing his first books, namely The Birth of Tragedy in 1872 and Human Auto Human in 1878. Nietzsche published more throughout the 1880s, including Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Beyond Good and Evil, which we'll be addressing today, The Genealogy of Morals, and the twilight of the idols. In these books, he developed some of his most well-known ideas. For example, that of the Übermensch, the will to power, the phrase God is dead, and the notion of slave and master morality. Nietzsche eventually became sick in 1889 and died in 1900. Just a quick note on the structure and purpose of Beyond Good and Evil. Beyond Good and Evil is written in aphorisms, These are short sayings that express general truths, comments or opinions on a given topic. This symbol here will be used to indicate the aphorism being referenced in a given chapter. In Nietzsche's works, he frequently employs something known as an ad hominem attack. This is where one criticises the person or the philosopher rather than their argument. This is usually seen as a fallacious means of argumentation, but Nietzsche understands the pitfalls of this argument. However, He deliberately chooses to use this method of attack in order to show us that there is a clear connection between the personality, temperament and the experience of the philosopher and the arguments that they make. Not all of Nietzsche's attacks are valid, but his purpose is not to prove to us, using traditional philosophical arguments, that his philosophy is the ultimate truth. Instead, he is inviting us to think about philosophy differently, suspiciously and with an aura of scepticism. So, To begin, the first prejudice that Nietzsche claims too many philosophers make is their fallacious view on something known as the will to truth. The will to truth is the philosopher's drive to search for the objective truth of the world that can supposedly be arrived at through rational inquiry. But Nietzsche states that we have never actually questioned why we value the truth so highly. What is the actual value of it? Why do we seek it so relentlessly? Why do we assume that the truth will be beneficial to us? Perhaps the truth may be the death of us and society and cause the collapse of all our world views and everything we hold dear to ourselves. Nietzsche asks, why not rather untruth and uncertainty, even ignorance? He knows that philosophers realise this potentially life-threatening nature of the truth and so the philosopher's will to truth is not actually some unbiased and open-minded striving for the truth. Instead, the philosopher's search for the truth is determined purely by their own unconscious instincts and desires. Their reasoning is reactive, not proactive. It is not really a genuine inquiry into the nature of truth. Instead, the truths that they express are merely an expression of their will. Nietzsche writes, What happens at bottom is that prejudice, a notion, and inspiration is defended by them with reason sought after the event. For example, the Stoics view nature, or the universe, or the cosmos, as a well-ordered system governed by deterministic rules that endows us with the ability to reason. The view that it is governed by deterministic rules implies the existence of fate, and thus the Stoics emphasise the importance of accepting fate, as it is an inherent facet of nature. But Nietzsche asks why they think the universe must be like this. Why is it not equally as likely that the universe is prodigal beyond measure, indifferent beyond measure, without aims or intentions, without mercy or justice? So Nietzsche states that the Stoics do not act according to nature like they say they do. Instead, they are trying to recreate nature in the image that they desire. Nietzsche writes, it creates the world in its own image. Furthermore, he writes, Stoicism is self-tyranny which is quite clear as Stoicism clearly advocates the importance of self-control, but Nietzsche thinks that this view is wrongly applied to nature. He thinks that just because the Stoic tyrannises over himself, he assumes the right to tyrannise over the cosmos and project his philosophy onto it and onto others. This is one aspect of the important concept known as the will to power, which we'll discuss later. 
The next problem Nietzsche attributes to other philosophers is their faith in antithetical values. The idea is that we think dualistically, we divide the world into opposites, for example, good and evil, cause and effect, truth and falsehood, conscious thinking and instinct, appearance and reality, and so on. We assume that these things are opposites, but Nietzsche argues that this is not the case. Conscious thinking is guided by our instinctive drives, falsehood allows us to simplify life in order to survive, good actions are founded upon self-interest, um, etc. Nietzsche states that we should transcend this shallow, dualistic way of thinking. In other words, we must go beyond good and evil. Next, Nietzsche disagrees with the separation of the world into the world of appearance, that means the things that we can see and experience with our senses, and the real world, which contains things in themselves rather than just things as they appear to us. For example, this is apparent in Plato's theory of forms and Immanuel Kant's conception of noumena. But Nietzsche states that these are delusions that devalue life, they devalue the here and the now. This splitting of the world into appearance and reality is just a result of the philosopher exerting their will to power, in that because they dislike this reality, they feel the need to construct another. This offers them solace and reassurance, in spite of their dislike of this reality of mere perception. Next is the idea of atomism. This is the idea that the world is composed of very small, indivisible and indestructible units called atoms. And it is this scientific idea that actually lays the basis for the religious view of the soul as something eternal, indestructible and indivisible. But Nietzsche states that we don't actually know if atomism is really an accurate way of seeing reality. Perhaps the soul is mortal, it's subjective and composed only of our drives and emotions. Also, the substance predicate nature of language is inherently atomistic, and this can lead us to problems, as we mistakenly exaggerate this to be an aspect of not only language, but of reality also. Just as a note, the substance is the subject, and the predicate is the property that we attribute to the subject. For example, in the sentence, the dog runs, the dog is the substance, and running is the predicate we attribute to him. The problem of immediate certainties follows on closely from this. Immediate certainties are truths that are supposedly so self-evident and obvious that we can be immediately certain of their truth. However, Nietzsche, along with empiricist philosopher David Hume, they were both sceptical of this idea of immediate certainties. One of the most well-known examples of one of these self-evident truths is Descartes' famous assertion, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. But Nietzsche claimed that there are multiple flaws in this seemingly self-evident assertion. For one, he states that it is wrong to assume that there is a single I. We can even see this for ourselves as, upon closer inspection and through some self-inquiry, it actually becomes clear that our concrete and atomistic concept of the self is not as immediately certain as we first assumed. When we look to see who we really are, we struggle to see exactly who and what we are. We cannot find that single and concrete I that Descartes assumes in his argument. Furthermore, it is wrong to assume that this single I, which we don't even know whether it exists or not, is the cause of thoughts. Again, upon closer inspection, we see that we have little control over our thoughts. Instead, we are at the mercy of them. Nietzsche writes, a thought comes when it wants, not when I want. So it is a falsification of the facts to say, the subject I is the condition of the predicate think. The need for an I as the prime cause shows how pervasive our need for atomism is. Next, Nietzsche critiques the view that our cardinal or most fundamental drive is that of self-preservation. Instead, Nietzsche writes that a living thing desires above all to vent its strength. Life as such is will to power. This important concept of the will to power was never systematically defined by Nietzsche, but it is generally understood in the following ways. So firstly, it is the will to take and to exert power over others. However, this is a fairly primitive expression of the will, and another way it is expressed is through the will to interpret and falsify reality to suit one's aims. This is an important aspect of slave morality, which we'll explore in a following video. But the will to power is not all negative, as it can also mean the will to perfect and transcend the self and exercise one's creative power. It is an important aspect of genius. 
So Nietzsche believes that it is the will to power that is the most fundamental drive in not only humans, but in every aspect of reality. He writes that self-preservation is only one of the indirect and most frequent consequences of it. The final prejudice Nietzsche accuses philosophers of adopting is their acceptance of something known as causa sui, Latin for cause of itself, better known as free will. Belief in the concept of free will will likely result from the substance predicate structure of language that we mistake for being an aspect of reality. So just because in language we talk about ourselves as being the cause of actions, it doesn't mean that in reality we are the cause of those actions. Nietzsche argues that we are not free because to be free we have to be cause of sui, the cause of ourselves, which he states is absurd. In other words, if we follow back the causal chain for any action, it should lead back to ourselves. But this doesn't happen because our choice, the supposed first cause, is caused by so many other things. For example, our neurochemistry, our childhood experiences, our unconscious drives and so on. In reality, the will is made up of a complex entwinement of different drives, sensations, feelings and thoughts. It is not some simplistic cause that we have full autonomy over, as Nietzsche accuses many philosophers of assuming. Thank you very much for watching, and be sure to like if you found the video useful, and subscribe for more videos. See you next time on Feeling Philosophical, and goodbye.